It's good to see everybody at 8 o'clock or 8.15 in the morning. Um, it's not my usual teaching time. Uh, it's probably not your usual uh, student time either. But uh, anyhow, it's, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Ten years ago, I did a uh, participated in this. Hi, Konye. Hi, Konye. Ah, thank you. And Konya Wereman, our Dean of Admissions and, and my personal guardian angel. Um, uh, so 10 years ago, I, did, uh, I spoke at this conference, and I had to go all the way to Houston to do it. Uh, and this year, I get to come downstairs. So uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate you all coming here to see me, because I'm sure that's what you all did, right? You all came here to see me, right? Um, and since you made it easy for me, let me try and make at least uh, the, the first year of law school a little easy for you, a little easier at least. Um, so I'm here to talk about the, the law school learning environment. And uh, originally the idea was to talk to you about uh, the first year classes that you'll be taking. Uh, everybody takes first year classes, but to my mind, uh, that, that seemed to be a bit of a disservice to you. I want to talk to you more about all of the different learning environments that are available to you in law school. It's true that your first year will be consumed with large classes, uh, but after that, for the most part, you'll be free to take a variety of different kinds of classes in different kinds of learning settings. Uh, and for me, that was something that saved my law school career. Because if all I did was take the first year 1L big classes, uh, I would have uh, stayed true to my commitment to quit law school after the first year. Not that it's so bad. I did not go to this law school. Let me make all that stuff really clear. But I just want you to understand at the outset that the big 1L classes is not all of law school. It's the beginning of law school. And that's it. After that, you get to choose what kind of learning environment you want to be in. And so today, we're going to talk about three major categories of learning environment. One is the large law school class. This is kind of it, uh, except typically this room would be cut in half. So it would be more like this, or like this, depending on it, how we went through it. But that's pretty typical of uh, first year classes. And, um, the second kind we're going to talk about is seminars. This is not going to be news to you. Everybody here has had a seminar, I imagine, at some point. And then the third part that we're going to talk about is the, are the experiential learning activities that are available in almost every law school. And those are quite different from some of the things you may have done in your college careers or may be doing now. Uh, and those are the things that, to my mind, uh, kind of make the, the trip worthwhile. Uh, not that the other stuff isn't, uh, but to my mind, those were sort of the capstone experiences, the things that allowed me to do what I came to law school to do. Uh, and so to me, that made a big difference. But let's talk about the large classes in the first year. Uh, they vary somewhat from place to place, but they all have uh, a lot of similarities, and you'll see them. First, let's just talk about the, the subject matter. So I'm going to pull up. Uh, the first year curriculum page here at the law school. And what you'll see is that the first year curriculum has your usual courses, civil procedure, constitutional law, contracts, criminal law, et cetera, uh, property, torts, those kinds of things. Those are foundational courses, and they're taught in the large classroom setting. And uh, anybody here have a sense of why law schools have large classroom settings. I'm sorry. Um, did somebody say something? Anybody know why? Yes, ma'am. So the Socratic method is a piece of it, but I could engage in the Socratic method with you out in the hallway. Um, I don't need all these people to do it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the Socratic method in, in, in a minute, but there is some value to do engaging in what you're referring to, which is the Socratic method in a larger classroom. There is some value to it. Uh, so that could be a reason. What's another possible reason? So thank you for that. 
Don't make me start calling on people at 8.20 in the morning. Oh, I'm going to see some people to call on. You got a reason? Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> So if I hear you correctly, one another reason might be to get everybody on the same page, at least in terms of what they're learning in terms of sub substantive issues in the first year. So everybody's in it together. You get to see everybody going through it together. There's some community building in that. You're a positive kind of guy. I, I, uh, <laughs> not most, many people aren't quite that generous when it comes to the answer to this question, but I appreciate it. Sir? Uh, simulate the competition that lawyers might engage in or experience later. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I suppose that's true to some extent, uh, but that would be a, that wouldn't, that is a reason for some people. It, it's not a great reason in my view. You're gonna have, first of all, <laughs> you've competed a lot to just to get to where you are. I don't think competition is new to anybody in this room. You wouldn't be here if it were. Um, but there is some of that to it. That kind of is fading. So I could, I could do this to you, right? I could say, uh, what's your name, sir? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Mr. Benson, uh, are we in your living room? Mr. Benson, are we in your living room? No. Um, is there chewing gum stuck to your behind? No. Then stand up when you speak to me in the classroom. No, I'm just messing with you. Um, <laughs> what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get to <laughs> is, is that's the stereotype of the kind of you know, gladiatorial first year class that was typical decades ago. And you'll still find it in some places, but that is really, as we know about stereotypes generally, not the real picture. And it's on the wane for sure. So if you run into that, then you've run into a dinosaur or somebody who's having off their meds or something like that. You know, that's just not the way it should go. I shouldn't be here to destroy you in order to get you to learn. So we're going to sacrifice Benson here so the rest, so the rest of you can learn something about God. That's not, that's, that, that's, that's, first of all, that's terrible teaching. And second of all, it's unfair to you. And third of all, it just, I don't know what that does except make me feel like a, I don't know, maybe big for 10 seconds. Um, and I'm pretty sure it doesn't do anything great for you at this point, right? So, so that, that, that piece of it isn't really that big anymore. Other ideas, ma'am? Good morning. But the big class is there to try and, as this gentleman said earlier, get folks on the same page and, and thinking and building some community together uh, and all that kumbaya kind of stuff. Sure. Um, that's true. And I will tell you, being a little bit more cynical about it, it also is a very efficient economic model. One person, they pay one dude, one person or a woman, to get up in front of a whole lot of people and teach you. Well, that, that's pretty good. Um, that's less expensive in the view than the seminars and the, the experiential learning opportunities that are out there. It turns out that if you do a deeper analysis, it's really not that true. Um, but because it costs a lot of money for us to pay for people to write law reviews that, and, and the like. I'm, I'm being filmed here, so I have to be, I have to be tactful. Um, but that is part of it. It's an economic uh, there's an economic rationale to it as well. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, how they operate, what happens in the first year classroom, uh, since we have some time to do that. First thing is you'd have assigned readings, and you'd have assigned readings from the beginning. So don't walk into class the first day thinking, what's up? Uh, you would know ahead of time what the syllabus says, and you would have done the reading. 
hopefully you won't do what I did. I uh, moved into an apartment in this neighborhood. I did not go to this law school, but I moved into an apartment in this neighborhood uh, the day before my first day of classes. Uh, and being the great planner that I was at the age of 22, I did not remember to bring any light bulbs. But I realized that I had a whole heap of reading to do for my first law school class. And so I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I turned on the only light source I had, which was a small television set. And I put my book in front of the television set, and I commenced to read. And I read, and I read, and I read, and I read until I had to get on the subway and go to class only to realize that I was trying to read all of the readings for the entire first semester. Not a good idea. Um, but the idea is there will be assigned readings. You'll have them from the first start. You should do your readings. I will tell you that, as you can tell, I am a genius. I'm brilliant. Um, and I read like a tortoise. Uh, it was different kind of reading for me. It wasn't like reading a novel or you know, something else that you know, I found. I was used to reading. This was like very slow reading, and I'm sitting there reading in English with a dictionary. It's like, it was the last time I needed a dictionary to read. Um, so it can go really slowly for you, and the idea is you should do all of your reading. But if you can't do all of your reading because you read slowly, or because you have a job, or because you have other responsibilities, the default isn't, I therefore won't do any of my reading. The default is, every rep counts. Every page counts. So read, ideally, everything you're assigned all the time. And if you can't, don't just say, well, I guess that's it. I'm done. No more reading. Um, so that's not a formula for success. Sir. You all, look, you all didn't just get hatched yesterday. You're all coming out of school, lots of practice, doing lots of reading. What are some tips to getting through a lot of dense material? Ma'am. <coughs> Something to keep you alive and brain alive while you're doing it. So whether it's taking some notes or highlighting or whatever you have to do to just stay engaged with the text because it's very easy to just start letting the words fly by. Uh, so that's one way to do it. What else? What other tips do you have, Ray? Man. So one thing that she's talking about is sort of keeping on the side an outline that will, you know, people keep outlines of courses to try and coalesce the ideas that are emerging from these reading of a ca these discrete cases. So from the reading of cases, you're supposed to build up some understanding of a body of law. And trying to figure out where this case fits into that body of law is a useful thing to do. Uh, other tips that people have, we'll try like, one more. Ma'am. Right. And so you're suggesting sort of, you know, giving yourself some time to start and stop. For myself, uh, one of the things that that I found was if I said to myself, I'm going to read for an hour, that did it for me. I do this with my wife and I when if she wants to go shopping to a place that I don't like to go shopping, 
Like I, I go to Home Depot, I could spend an hour, you know, hours there. My kids don't like it, but my, my <laughs> but I like it. Um, my wife likes to go to some places where they hang a lot of stuff from the from the ceiling, and I bang my head, and I feel like I'm in a bad trip. Um, and I say, I'm gonna go. We're gonna go for an hour, and at the end of that hour, we're out. Buy it, don't buy it, we're gone, right? And I know for an hour I can make it because I can sit there and I can go 37 more minutes. I'm out of here, right? Um, the same thing with this. You could say to yourself, I'm going to do it for an hour. Uh, I'm going to do it for an hour and a half. I'm going to do it for an hour. I'm going to do something else for a half hour. Something else could be exercise. I think exercise is huge. Uh, I learned to be a runner in law school um, because that was something I could do real quick. I didn't have to get together five of my closest friends to go play ball. I could just go outside, run for a half hour, come back inside. And then I was ready to read for a little bit more. Lots of tips to do it. Um, but the idea is to do it as much as you can, try and stay engaged, whether it's notes, highlighting, outlining, taking breaks, that kind of stuff. All that stuff is helpful to it. But don't give up just because you can't do it all. Uh, so there will be reading. What else happens in the big classroom? There are seating charts. So I would know, theoretically, who each one of you were because you'd be in an assigned seat and in a seat that you would stay in for the whole semester. So I'd know that's Mr. Benson. And Mr. Benson's always going to be there, whether he's wearing that tie or not, right? That's Benson. Um, and so I can say, so tell me about this case, Mr. Benson. And Mr. Benson would tell me about, don't, <laughs> easy, Mr. Benson. <laughs> I feel like I've scarred you for life. Don't, don't let me do that to you. Um, so that's the idea. There is some what is called cold calling, where I just say, Mr. Benson. And Mr. Benson's sitting there going, what the heck did I do? Um, I'm going to be, Mr. Benson, you and I are going to be good friends by the time this is, this is over. Um, but cold calling is a technique where the idea is to try and make sure everybody's doing the reading, to make sure I hear from all the different voices in the classroom uh, so that I don't just hear from the same 10 people who raise their hand all the time. You know who you are. Um, you? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's, there is some cold calling. Not everybody does it. Some people take volunteers. There are variations on cold calling. There can be like, I'll tell you, look, you folks, you're responsible for next, uh, the, next, the readings in the next class. Um, <clears throat> so be ready, because I'm going to be calling on you. Some people do that. I don't find that terribly useful. Uh, some people will allow folks to phone a friend or um, do all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's fine. It, cold calling. Some people, I was in a uh, seminar last night where teachers were talking to teachers, and some people said the more you do the cold calling, the easier it becomes for everybody else because it takes some of the heat out of it. So it's not just, you know, today is Benson Day, um, and you got to worry about whether or not the next day is your day, ma'am, right behind Mr. Benson. Um, yeah, you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it takes the heat off it if I call on this one, and 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 20 people get called on, it's like, all right, already. It's not a big thing. We get to, we get to build that community that my generous friend here in the front thinks is going to happen. Uh, and in fact, can. Um, the Socratic method. Ma'am, you mentioned the Socratic method. Um, so that is something that is common. The Socratic method is you know, attributed to Socrates, one of the, uh, the great philosophers. And the idea is I ask question after question after question. To what end? What am I trying to do through the Socratic method? Any thoughts? Ma'am? So, the, so an idea is that we're going to try and get you to see multiple sides to issues. Uh, another idea is we're trying to get you to, 
to separate the wheat from the chaff, to be able to analyze, learn to do legal analysis in a way so that you can say, this is what's important about this case, or this is what I think is important about this case. You may say, I think those are some of the facts, but it was also important that X, Y, and Z happened. Uh, this is where, who, did, you gave me the, who gave me the outlining tip? Um, this is where the outline could come in handy. You say, I see, you, Johnson's making me read this case because it's going to teach me more about consideration in contracts. So that's what we're talking about. So it's a way of trying to engage in question after question after question to get you to understand. So an example might be, um, let's see. Um, Ma'am, can a United States president be impeached? Yes, the answer is yes. No, but it, it's possible. Um, by what authority? Excuse me? Congress, you're saying? But pursuant to what? Congress just decides, Nancy Pelosi gets up and says, ha ha, have I got something for you. Uh, by what authority? By what authority? The Constitution. The Constitution. This is an example of how questioning can go in cold calling. I'm asking you. I see that you're stuck. I could sit there and bear down on you and make you more and more uncomfortable, or I can ask for volunteers, or you could phone a friend and you could alienate your friend over here for the rest of your life by saying, well, she'll tell you, um, that kind of stuff. So yeah, so that's an idea. So I'm getting you to say by what authority, what's the rationale for doing it, what's the process for doing it, and we unpack together more and more understanding about the law, uh, through questions that help you see, in theory, what somebody who analyzes the law for a living would do so that you understand how to do it for yourselves. That's the theory. And Socratic method is alive and well in, uh, in, in law school classes. And it's not a bad tool. It's not the only tool that people use. Outlining is out there, of course. Um, and the Marine Corps approach that Mr. Benson explained, where you know it's like competition, you know, death by gladi gladiator. Uh, you know, we're gonna take all of your minds, and we're gonna take that mush that's between your ears, and we're gonna turn you into lean, mean, lawyering machines. That's kind of on the way out. Uh, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't worry too much about that. We're trying to get folks to think. Most law schools take the approach that we admitted you. We want to prove ourselves right, uh, so we want you to get there with us. So let's talk about outputs. What's the output of your first year class? What, it is, what is it that you get uh, graded upon? Because you will be graded. Come on, nobody knows this? You're killing me. Where are you? Who are you? Ma'am. There's a final exam. And typically, there is a final exam. A you know high stakes you know one one shot to show what you've learned. In some places, the people are trying experimenting with other kinds of things because, pedagogically, at least from my perspective, that's a pretty poor way to for me to assess whether or not you're actually what you're learning, how well you're learning it, etc. Uh, there are variations on the final exam. There's the in class closed book final exam. The value to that is it tends to be shorter. Um, but it's closed book and you've got to rely on memory and understanding to get there. There are the open book final exams which have the advantage of, you know, you can do it in your PJs at home, but you get like eight hours to do it. When you've got eight hours to write something, you might feel some pressure to write something really good in eight hours. And the good thing about a three or two hour final exam is everybody knows it's three or two hours, you've got no books open, you know, you're gonna have you're gonna get something a little bit different than if I say you got eight hours and you can look at anything you want. Kind of expecting the bar to be up a little bit higher. So there are variations on it, but typically that's the output. All right, so that's one category of the three categories of learning environments for law school. Second category is seminar. How many people here has taken a seminar? All right, so why are we talking about seminars? You know what a seminar is. Small classroom, narrower topics. Typically in law school, the topics reflect the things that, um, that the teacher is very interested in at this moment in time. Let's see. 
Um, so here's an upper class course list. You'll see under each title, there are the courses and then the seminars. Um, so here are all the civil procedure and dispute resolution seminars. But there are, you know, 10 to 20 people in a room. You sit around the table. The questioning is not so much Socratic so much as there is a lot of reading. And you discuss the readings. Often students lead discussions. Uh, there are sometimes guest speakers and the like. Um, you can, uh, it's a lot less rigid in the sense that there's uh, not too much structure to it. They're expecting you to guide the discussion. Uh, I think one of the advantages is it's a more personalized learning environment. So we get to hear what you think as opposed to necessarily what you think you know. But you know your opinion, your theories, your beliefs about how this could go, and people are in that together, and that's a good thing. Uh, of course, it's a smaller class, so everybody's going to participate. In a room this size with this many people, some of you all can hide. Now, if I'm good at my job, you won't be able to hide for long. Um, but in a seminar, you can't hide. If we're sitting around a table and there are 10, 15 people of us there, everybody's going to say something. Um, and we're going to do that a lot. So you're going to get more, more opportunities to talk. The output in the seminar, unlike the first year classes or the large classes generally, usually a paper of some kind, some kind of research, some kind of paper. Not a big surprise. Uh, the third and uh, final type of offering in the law school curriculum uh, are the experiential learning opportunities. Uh, and at most schools, you've got a variety of them. So you've got clinics and externships, uh, moot court simulations and the like. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about clinics and externships. Uh, so I'm a clinical professor. I teach a clinic. I've been here at Columbia for 30 years. I've taught clinics that did um, civil rights work, and now I'm doing a clinic that uh, explores the intersection of technology with law practice so that you get out there and you can use the tools that are very powerful in law practice to help you practice at the top of your game. Um, I will tell you a little bit about why clinics saved my law school career because I quit after my first year of law school. I, I got to the end of the year, I gave it the old postgraduate try, you know, I was tempted to quit after the first semester, not because it was so terrible, just because it seemed very disconnected from why I came to law school. I'm reading cases about who owned the fox back in 1780-something or other, and I came to law school to do civil rights, and I'm thinking, what does this possibly have to do with what I want to do in the world? And I gave it a semester. I said, give it a semester, you know. I uh, gave it the semester. I was like, oh, all right, I'm here, whatever. I'll do the next semester. I gave it the year. At the end of the year, I'm cleaning out my locker. The associate dean had been very kind to me. says, uh, oh, I'll see you in September. And I said, nah, pump the brakes on that. Um, not so sure I'm coming back. Why? Well, you know, and I told him my little rationale. He said, you know, why don't you take the summer and think about it? We'll keep your place warm. If you're really not coming back, give me a call. But that's the idea. So uh, by the grace of God, I got an internship at the Legal Aid Society's Harlem office, which was a civil office where we stopped evictions and we put food on the table and we kept families together. We prevented domestic violence. And very quickly, I came to learn that all that stuff that was boring the um, stuffing out of me, I'm editing, um, when I was in my first year class, turned out to be really important stuff. Um, but I also discovered something else. My first client came in and uh, she was walking very slowly. I, was a, I had just graduated from my first year of law school and I was interning. She's walking very slowly and she had a cane and she made her way slowly to my little cubicle and she sat down and Turns out, how many of you know who Isaac Hayes it was? Good. This will save us some time. Isaac Hayes was a, a great songwriter for Stax Records uh, in Memphis. He was a DJ. Uh, he's done all kinds of things. Some of you may know him as the voice of Chef in South Park. 
don't know how that happened. Um, but anyhow, one of the things that Isaac Hayes did when he was a performer was he had very elaborate stage shows, and particularly amazing costumes. You can see the costumes all over. This woman, who was my first client, was the person who took Isaac Hayes' ideas for what a costume should look like and made the costumes. That was her job. And now she's hobbling in with a cane. She can barely move. And, uh, and I said, well, how can I help you, ma'am? And she tells me the following story. And she tells me that it was September 1st, I believe 1975. I may have the date wrong. It's midnight of that night. She lives in a brownstone in Harlem, one floor. Uh, and she hears <laughs> knock on the door. She says, well, this is strange. Who is it? They say, Con Edison. That's our local utility. And she says, uh, I didn't call Con Edison. I go, let us in, let us in. She goes, uh, I didn't call Con Edison. Uh, I'm not letting you in. I say, well, we, we, there's a gas leak. We, we, there's a gas leak. She says, I don't smell a gas leak. Go away. Let us in. Let us in now. We're going to break the door down. She said, I'm not letting you in. It's midnight. I'm by myself. I'm not letting you in. Um, and then with that, she starts hearing people starting to try and break the door down. So she starts backpedaling through her one floor apartment to try and get to the back end where there's a fire escape and a window. And just as she gets to the window, she sees the door fly open and a bunch of guys with guns are coming into her apartment. She claws at the window to try and get the window open so she can get out to the fire escape and maybe flee. But the window is stuck, or she's too nervous to get it open from all the paint. So she does the only thing she can think to do to save herself. She throws herself through the window out onto the fire escape. She's cut herself so much that she needs 200 stitches. She's bleeding on the fire escape. And when she looks up, she sees policemen with their guns trained on her. It was midnight of the first night of the Rockefeller no-knock drug laws, and they had the wrong apartment. Now, the whole time she's telling me this, I'm sitting there like, you are. Um, and I got one thought going through my head the whole time. And that thought is, geez, lady, you ought to see a lawyer. Um, the problem was, she thought she was seeing a lawyer. And the problem was, after one year of law school, I didn't have the faintest idea what to do for this person. And that made me think, maybe I need to approach some of the experiential learning opportunities back in law school so I could learn how to be a lawyer. Because in the first year, you learn substantive law concepts. But in experiential activities, particularly like clinics, you learn how to practice law. You learn some of the basic skills. What are some of the basic skills of lawyering? Name, name some. Negotiation. Name another one. Interpersonal, Interpersonal skills, like what? Um, how to with <laughs> so people. In interviewing. Right. right. What else? Critical thinking. Critical thinking. Now, say again. That's not a skill. That's that's knowledge, right? You're supposed to know that, and that you would get in common law, hopefully. Um, Ma'am. Researching, and you'll get that a lot in the first year, too, but you'd learn to do that, ma'am. So learning how to communicate in plain language is very, it's a hard skill, and lawyers are renowned for not doing it well. Ma'am? Building logical arguments is sure, so, you know, oral or, or written advocacy, these are core skills, learning how to draft something that's going to be persuasive and get a result that the client wants from the court, or how to stand up on your own feet and argue a motion and do those kinds of things. So interviewing, counseling, negotiation, drafting, all of these things are traditional skills. In the contemporary world that we live in, you also need to know how to do electronic fact gathering, because you're going to have to make the facts. I would have to sort out from that story that I just told you what are the operative facts if I want to get legal relief? So all that stuff about her you know, running and jumping through the window has some legal relevance, but I got to figure out how it's legally relevant. 
Is it legally relevant because it goes to damages? Is it legally relevant so it goes to her state of mind? Is it legally relevant because there were alternatives for the police that they didn't have to force her? Who knows, but I've got to make those facts. I've also got to know how to manage the knowledge that I have in a way and present it in ways that aren't just dependent on 100, 200 year old ways of doing it, writing something on a piece of paper or standing up in court. I'm going to present it using presentation tools. I'm going to present it using evidence that's electronically displayed. I'm going to use it doing all kinds of things or simulations that work. So all of those core skills are things I've got to learn to do. And unless I learn to do those things, all the stuff you're learning in your substantive law classes is of less value. It's not useless, but it's of less value if I can't employ it to be an effective lawyer. And in the experiential opportunities, you get the opportunity to learn how to practice law under supervision. So I have eight students, so now we're sort of moving down from big, big classroom to seminar of eight to 20, you know, of 10 to 20 students to my clinic, which has got eight students, and God save them all, they've got me as their supervisor. And there's a, there's a seminar component, we meet twice a week, and we go through five hours of classes a week, and then each of the people who are in my seminar, or in my clinic rather, are teamed up on cases and projects, and I meet with each of those teams for an hour and a half each week, at least. And so you're going to get a lot of my working on your interpersonal skills, my helping you think about critically how do we attack this problem, thinking about strategy, thinking about how the legal analysis that we learned through the Socratic method is going to be put to good use here, where I create, I hear a set of facts that I've gathered, I apply the law that I think is relevant, and I present it in an effective way to achieve your goals and concerns as the client. That's what lawyers do, and you don't learn that in a seminar, and you don't learn that in a course. You learn that through experience. And so, and, a, and a, an analogy I can give you is, if, you, if I want to teach you to swim, you and I can stand on the beach, sure, all summer long, and I can talk to you about the properties of buoyancy, and this is the front stroke, and this is the back stroke, and this is the breast stroke, and I can talk to you about holding your breath, and I can talk to you about riptides and currents, I can tell you how to judge the height of the waves and all of this other stuff, but you and I both know that if you want to learn how to swim, there's only one way that's going to happen. Get yourself in the water. And in a clinic, you get in the water with me. So that if you start to go down, I can decide how long you've been down and whether or not you're going to come back up. And if I don't think you're coming back up, I'll pull you back up. Um, but I'm going to let you struggle a little bit because you need to understand, well, what do I do when I'm going down? Right? Well, I'll flap my wings and I'll kick my legs and I hold my breath and I come back up and I go, oh, look who survived. Um, so clinics are places where you learn through experience by doing real work. The output here is the real work that you do for real people under someone's close supervision where you get a lot of intensive training. You, don't, you can't be anonymous in my clinic. You can try, but you can't win. Um, because we're going to do this work together. And for almost every student, the idea that we're doing this for a client is a whole different bag from I'm doing this for a grade. Because you can decide how much of a grade you want. Hopefully, you want good grades. And you're going to work hard to get them. But for a client, you can't decide, eh, C is good enough. You can try that, but not on my watch. Um, there are lawyers out there who do that, but not around me and not around you when you're trained properly, because you won't settle for that. So experiential opportunities like clinics are out there. Externships are somewhat different in that you don't get the full-time me working with you all the time. I farm you out to somebody else who you do work for, and then you come back and you tell me about it, and I try to help you 
structure your understanding of it so that you learn some from that experience as well. But it's a less intensive, less high credit experience. Here at Columbia, clinics are seven credits for a semester. Well, you can only take, I think, 15 credits at most in a semester. So that's half your load. But you're expected to spend 20 hours a week doing my work, right? Reading from my classes, being in my classes, coming to the meetings, working with the clients, securing a, you know, a good result for them. But in that, you get an intensive experience. I have two children, one of whom decided to be a lawyer, and the other is a school teacher. Um, and so I figured both of them take after me. But um, the, um, the one who is a lawyer actually came to school here, and he said, look, what should I do? So I'll tell you what I told my own son, right? Um, take a clinic as soon as you can. You usually can't take them in your first year at all, but if you can get it in your second year or your third year, get in there. They're often oversubscribed, so in, enroll or apply early. It's like Chicago voting, early and often. Um, and uh, I, I kid Chicago, but they deserve it. Um, the, um, but the idea is apply in as early as you can, get into a clinic, get somebody who's going to give you that intense one-on-one -on -one supervision guidance, and then take your externships. Because then when you're out in the field, I have a basis for understanding what it is I see out there as compared to what I learned to do when it was focused on me. Uh, and take as many as you're allowed to. Now, in, uh, under the ABA rules, you have to have six credits of experiential learning. That's fairly recent development, and that's a good thing because people learn a lot more about the law when they see it in action than they do necessarily when they read about it in books. So when I did a civil rights clinic, I could have you read the statutes that prohibit housing discrimination, and I could test you on it. But in my clinic, you're going to be counseling a person who has been discriminated against three weeks into the semester, and I'm going to be seeing that recorded, uh, or I'm going to be there with you. That's going to be your final exam, and that's three weeks in. What are we going to do for the next 12 weeks? Well, we're going to win the case is what we're going to try and do. Um, so there's a lot of deeper learning about the law, not just about the skills that are out there that happens in these experiential offerings. And it saved my life because it reconnected me to why I came to law school. All of a sudden, that stuff that seemed abstract in civil procedure was the difference between getting somebody evicted and not getting them evicted. It's like, oh, that's why those seemingly abstract, bizarre rules make a difference. So it gives you context for understanding the law. It gives you some reconnection to what you want to do. It teaches you how to practice. So those are the things that are out there. I want to show you one other thing, and then I'm going to stop. Um, one of the things that we talked about was you know, Mr. Benson and the gladiatorial uh, view of, of, uh, of law school. There can be some of that. There is some, every place you go, or somebody wants to compete for something. But that's less on, that's really on the wane these days. There's a lot of support for you in law school. Um, so affinity groups like BALSA are really important. Uh, somebody in BALSA took me under my, their, her wing when I got to law school, and I became the chair of my BALSA group when I was in law school. That was helpful to me. Uh, there are writing programs, advising programs, student services have grown in importance and in personnel over time, and placement. I'm showing you this picture. This is a picture of, it says the New York Law School class of 2013. I actually think that date is wrong, and I think that for a reason, because one of the people in this picture is my grandfather. I am Conrad A. Johnson III. Conrad A. Johnson Sr. is in this picture. Can you pick him out? It shouldn't be too hard, right? He was the president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, community outreach coordinator for his BALSA group, because he was his BALSA group. Um, you, you have a very different atmosphere that you're working in. There are lots of people who can stand shoulder to shoulder with you, who can help you through those feelings that everyone has when they walk out of class where you go, I must be the only person who doesn't understand this. If you keep that to yourself, then you really aren't very bright. 
because I guarantee you, almost everyone in the class is walking out going, I must be the only person in this class who didn't understand that. And the people who say, don't say that are probably the people who didn't understand it. Um, so you'll have lots of folks out there who will be there to support you in the administration like we do here and within your, the network of people that you're building as your colleagues. And it's that network of colleagues, the people you see around you right here in this room and that you'll be working with through three years in law school who are going to be incredibly important to you, who will teach you at least as much about the law as anybody standing up here where I am. And they're going to be your colleagues for the rest of your life. My law school class is like a little mafia. We're everywhere. Um, and we just have inroads all over the place. My little legal aid group is like a mafia. Everywhere you go, yeah, I know that judge because I hired that judge. I know that judge. I worked for that person when she was a lawyer. Um, it's absolutely true that the person who runs the legal aid society here in the city of New York was a student in my office. Who knew? Um, but you're working with people who are going to be great colleagues to you. So work with them. Don't try and do it alone. Um, I'm out of time. I'm happy to answer a couple of questions, but I know there are people who want to come up next. Sir. Here's a way of answering that, what is a very complicated question. It's a good question, but it's, it's, it's a complicated question. One thing is to say to you that you have tools available to you through the internet to gather facts that we didn't have, right? When I was in your shoes, there was no internet. I know, it's an amazing thought, but it's true. There was no internet. So I had to gather facts by talking to people. The, the, the woman's uh, fact pattern that I gave you I gathered from talking to her, um, but I also had to gather it from going out and trying to find records and talking to other people. Nowadays, I can do a lot of gathering. Chances are there was a news story about that that I'm going to find um, online. Chances are there's stuff I'm going to find out about other incidents where the police made improper raids as part of the no-knock drug policy. I'm going to learn more about the New York New York New no-knock drug laws that were in effect at the time by going online and finding that out. So learning to use the tools of the digital age, of digital practice, are a thing that I think some folks think they're going to do by just feeling lucky with Google. And there's, there's a real structure to how you do competent fact development in the digital age. And you should learn that stuff. So that's an answer to your question. But I'm going to stop here. I appreciate all of your attention, particularly this early in the morning. Uh, and I wish you all the best of luck. I'm so glad you're here. We're honored to have you here at Columbia, and all, all success to you. Thank you very much.